Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me as a guest Dr. Craig McAllister. Dr. McAllister is an orthopedic surgeon from Kirkland, Washington, where he practices complex surgery of the hip and knee. Uh, Dr. McAllister did his medical school training at the University of Washington. He then went on to complete an orthopedic residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. From there, he completed an orthopedic fellowship in joint reconstruction and arthritis surgery of the hip and knee at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Today, we're going to be talking about topics associated with the hip and knee arthritis. Thank you, Dr. McAllister, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, today, what I'd like to talk about first is, is the concept of degenerative arthritis of the knee. I mean, we've all, talked about, we've all heard the term osteoarthritis. We've heard the term wear and tear arthritis, degenerative arthritis. Um, tell me a little bit about degenerative arthritis of the knee. How does that start? What causes it? And uh, what sort of symptoms are we, are we apt to see with that patient? Well, I think the way one of the phrases that you use to describe it is one of the most um, comprehensive and, and easiest to understand when you just called it wear and tear arthritis. There are an awful lot of different types of arthritis that are recognized, and uh, wear and tear arthritis or degenerative arthritis is certainly the most common. I think one of the most difficult uh, aspects of wear and tear arthritis for patients to understand is that the, the, the problem as far as the knee or the hip or any of the joints are concerned is usually they're well before the symptoms are ever uh, noticeable to the patient. Uh, they might be a sore knee after a sporting event, they might be a knee that stays sore after exercise, might even be a joint that seems sore and swollen and stiff just with re uh, weather related changes. Um, so for, I think for a great majority of patients with uh, wear and tear arthritis they're having some awareness of symptoms well before they ever present to an orthopedic surgeon. Mm. Now, now one thing, you know, a lot of people come into the office and they, they, they have these symptoms that you're talking about. They have pain, and, and usually it's pain associated with activity. And the first thing they want to know is, is when did the injury occur? What, yeah. How have I injured my knee? Yeah. Um, what I hear you saying is that maybe this isn't an injury. Maybe this is something that just occurs over time. It, and it really can be both or, or other things. So certainly for an orthopedic surgeon who's specializing in knee, a lot of the wear and tear problems have to do with alignment issues. They may have been born with legs that are slightly bow-legged or too knock-kneed and they can get wear and tear in one part of their knee. Um, in the hip, as you know, sometimes they can have childhood developmental problems that go on later in life, 40s, 50s, 60s, to cause premature arthritis in the hip. Uh, and then there are the, tra the, the patients with true trauma, and, and most surgeons will actually call that post-traumatic arthritis, but it, even though it, it's related to the trauma, it's still a basic wear and tear type of arthritis with the same symptoms and the same appearance on the x-rays. Mm -hmm. Now, do you distinguish between the terms osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis, and, and you've just given us a new term, post-traumatic arthritis, and then that whole wear and tear problem? There's been a lot of controversy as to whether osteoarthritis um, is genetic in any way. I mean, uh, do you think that think of this as a genetic disease? I think those three terms that you, you mentioned, wear and tear arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, and osteoarthritis, all share this element of wear and tear. But they are, I think for the physician and for the orthopedic surgeon in particular and for the patient, they are distinct entities. And there are a couple of important differences that patients need to understand about them. Osteoarthritis is a very common disease state that probably is related to genetics, probably related to environment. Um, by the time we're in our 70s, fully 70% 70 of people get it, and only 15% are aware of it. And, and um, so it, it tends to be a more benign type of arthritis, a little bit less severe in terms of its prognosis. But it also tends to hit multiple joints. So when grandma and grandpa talk about their rheumatism affecting their their back and their shoulders and their knees and their hips, but being pretty well tolerated, that, that's very accurate. That's different from post-traumatic arthritis, which uh, tends to be only one joint, tends to leave uh, many patients with a very severely affected joint, hits earlier in life in the active patient, may or may not have been preventable either before the injury or with proper treatment after the injury, and uh, has a poor prognosis overall. And then, of course, the third one is that malalignment type of arthritis that, uh, that is, also has an equally poor prognosis. 
Now, now let's go back and, and, and look at the injuries that can cause post-traumatic ar arthritis. What type of injuries are we talking about? Are we just talking about fractures that involve the joint, ligament injuries, all of the above? What other things can be injured that can lead to post-traumatic arthritis? Well, the, the answer to that is probably is as many as there are patients who have stories about their injuries. But realistically, I'd say the three that you touched on are the most common. There's the, the badly fractured joint, the patient who has the, the fracture that goes into the knee or a fracture that goes into the hip, and, and that disrupts the joint surface, what we call the articular cartilage, that smooth cartilage, and, and if the fracture actually goes into that cartilage, they're set for arthritis early in life. Another real common one are the, are the ligament injuries that leave uh, joints unstable, and, and you know as well as I do that historically a lot of those ligament injuries went untreated. Mm -hmm. And I think that most surgeons recognize that that's a, a setup for later arthritic problems. Another real, real common one is the meniscal tear. And we've chatted about that previously where a patient loses part or all of their cartilage, their meniscus, and we know that if they lose all of their meniscus, 85% of those patients are gonna have arthritis within 30 years after that index injury. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very, very common sequence of events in patients that I'm now seeing at age 55, 58, 60 who are needing a knee replacement will report a, a meniscal injury and a, and a meniscectomy when they were in their 20s. Okay, so they injured them, twisted their knee, uh, went in and had their cartilage removed like you know you hear football players, basketball players, lots of athletes, and then uh, what you're saying is that they pay the price 30 years later. It's yes. not like they have pain immediately, but 30 years later that knee's worn out. Right. The other thing I think that people don't realize sometimes, you don't actually have to injure the joint itself. I mean, sometimes exactly. you can fracture the bone below right. it, mm -hmm. and that creates that malalignment that you're talking about, which you know, now all of a sudden that joint's not working appropriately, and, and the right. pressure is unbalanced, and that causes, over time, damage to the cartilage. I think that orthopedic surgeons uniformly will agree that we're becoming increasingly aware of the impact of these malalignment problems. Mm -hmm. You know, being bow-legged is, is not all that innocent. It's certainly innocent when we're 10 and 20 and 30 and maybe even into our 40s. But it doesn't take much more than a two or three degree shift from a nicely, normally aligned leg before we're starting to see selective wear in one part of the knee. And it probably also has impact on the hip and, the, and the, even the spine, but certainly it's the knee that's taking the real brunt of that malalignment. You know, another thing that I think the MRI scan has taught us you know, it's an old wise teller. We used to tell everybody before the MRI scanner that you don't bruise bones. You know, you, there's no such right. thing as a bone bruise. Now mm -hmm. we're seeing that, sure enough, there's a bone bruise, and you see them in the knee a lot. You see them right. in the ankle a lot. And the other question is, is what does that do to that articular cartilage? Right. You know, we used to just think that articular cartilage uh, was not injured like that. But now with the MRI scan, we're seeing more and more um, these damages to the articular cartilage that take months to years to sort of play themselves right. out and end up wearing that articular cartilage down. Well, and it becomes a profoundly important point when that 38-year-old, 42-year-old, 50-some-year-old is presenting to their orthopedic surgeon with the idea that I need a meniscus tear taken care of. And, and the MRI is actually already showing a little bit of early degenerative arthritis on the rest of the knee. Mm. It has implications in terms of the, the success of that meniscectomy, but it also has implications in terms of the long-term course for that patient. That meniscus tear that is going to be managed arthroscopically is actually part of the early arthritis. Mm -hmm. And so it has bearing on the, the whole role of arthroscopy in that arthritic knee. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we ought to back up too and, and, and clarify a couple of terms. And one is this term arthritis. And what we need to do, I think, is distinguish osteoarthritis and all these things, post-traumatic wear and tear yeah. arthritis, mm -hmm. from the, the other thing people associate with arthritis, and that is what we would call rheumatoid variants or mm -hmm. different type of systemic illnesses. Right. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout even, some of these things that cause what we see as arthritis right. as, a, as a, a term that's just used to describe a whole bunch of things, but differentiate rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, those things from osteoarthritis, how do they differ? That's a very powerful and very important conversation, but it's also important to understand that actually the Arthritis Foundation recognizes only a, over 140 different varieties of arthritis. Osteoarthritis has been divided up into seven different groups, so it, the whole conversation can actually get a little out of control. Mm. Um, you've mentioned uh, uh, five or six different types of arthritis, 
But I think for the patient, it's very helpful to break them down to simply um, degenerative or wear and tear arthritis and inflammatory arthropathies or inflammatory types of arthritis. And it, it's meaningful for the patients because they really do, those two groups of arthritis sort of um, aggregate in terms of how they present for the patient and also how they're managed and who, what kind of doctor manages them. Uh, certainly, I would say that the overwhelming majority of simple wear and tear arthritis is going to be managed either by the primary care physician or by an orthopedic surgeon with some overlap with the rheumatologists. But the overwhelming majority of orthopedic surgeons who specialize in surgical management of inflammatory arthritis will want to make sure that that rheumatologist was on board first because they respond very well to medicines. Mm -hmm. But rheumatoid arthritis, you mentioned crystalline arthropathies like gout, uh, pseudo gout, um, other types of uh, um, psoriatic arthritis, uh, infectious related uh, arthritis that may have been from an exposure to a virus or other um, food related. Um, really, arthritis only means inflamed joint. Mm. So, whether it's a food related allergy or anything else, it can fall under the, the definition of arthritis, and that's why the Arthritis Foundation recognizes over 100. 40 different varieties. Yeah, and I think that's sometimes confusing to patients. They don't mm -hmm. really understand the difference between, for example, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis from them, their, their knee hurts, for example. Yes. Um, but like you say, the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, there that is primarily treated medically. I mean, it's it's treated with chemotherapy, and, and that's not the same for these wear and tears. They're treated primarily with mechanical means, surgery and that sort of stuff. We can control the symptoms, but we can't stop the disease process. Right. Rheumatoid arthritis, you can actually stop or slow down the disease process and slow down the destruction with the right medications. That's Sometimes. An important point. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those patients will go on to require True. major True. orthopedic surgical interventions, but we, we certainly would like to, to know, that, and we certainly need to know that the majority of them will be well managed medically. Well, let's move on to symptoms from the standpoint of, of what does a typical person with knee and hip arthritis, how do they present to your office? What sort of symptoms are they complaining about at the time they present? Well, it's important. You, you know, you've, you've mentioned knee and hip. I, I think you need to differentiate those to, in order to be able to talk about that intelligently. I also think you need to separate them in terms of where they are in that disease, early, midterm, or late disease, because they're, they're dramatically different. But just for the purpose of conversation, let's say we're going to talk about that first onset. Let's talk about early disease in the hip and knee. I think the symptoms that they'll have in common will, will largely be some, some type of achiness and discomfort and maybe some stiffness and sense of swelling even if they can't see it. They won't see their swelling in their hip, but they'll see the swelling in their knee. It, it'll very commonly be mainly in the morning. They'll have some startup discomfort. It'll tend to ease up, get a little bit better as they, as they move along. It'll uh, typically respond nicely to routine medical interventions that most patients will actually do on their own. They'll, they'll go and find some anti-inflammatories, maybe take some Tylenol, and quite honestly, a lot of patients simply put up with it early. By the time they're getting to their orthopedic surgeon, it's usually because either medications have failed and their primary care doctor has encouraged an orthopedic consult or because the pain and the symptoms and the stiffness and maybe even disuse, you know, poor function will have persisted to the point where it's starting to interfere with their everyday activities. And while it might ease up a little when they start to walk, it then actually gets worse as the day progresses. And in late phase, mm -hmm. we're talking about people who are having pain at night, probably um, it's, it's really getting in their way. I mean, it's not just a discomfort. These folks are that's not right. able to do the things they want to do. Well, and that's where I think increasingly you, you then now need to, to differentiate hip from knee because their presentation will be considerably different. And, and how so? I mean, how will the hip person differ from yeah. the knee person? The, the truth is that the knee does not tolerate, or let me rephrase that, patients aren't able to accommodate to bad knee function as well as they can to bad hip function. Once they start to lose a certain amount of motion in that knee, it's just plain old hard to go up and down stairs. Mm -hmm. And everyday activities start to get more and more difficult, particularly if it's a malalignment disease, because as it gets later in, into the disease, everybody will notice that the leg's getting more, bow, more and more bow-legged. It'll get unstable. Walking on uneven ground becomes more and more difficult. The, um, the knee is much less responsive to simple interventions like the use of a cane. The hip, on the other hand, tends to be one of those joints where as long as their back is doing well and the other hip and their knees, Patients will accommodate that pretty well unless the pain simply gets so intense that they can't tolerate it. 
and you mention that, nighttime discomfort to where they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients will find that they can position their knee on a pillow or whatever and get away with the sleep, but with a hip, if they just roll over, then it tends to wake them up at night, interferes with um, you know, even simple functions like uh, the, with the hip of reaching down to, to get to your toenails and tie your shoes gets more and more difficult. That's the stiffness element. Uh, but the, the location of hip pain in, is, very, is very characteristic, which tends to be in the groin and in that inner part of the thigh, whereas in the knee, obviously, it's more located in the knee. Mm. Well, let's move on to, to how you as an orthopedist assess and make the diagnosis of, of what's going on. When this person is referred to your office mm -hmm. and you see someone who you're suspecting of knee arthritis or wear and tear degenerative arthritis of the knee, what are you going to do? What, what sort of steps do you go through to try to figure out how best to treat this person? Well, now it's important to go back to where they are in the stage of their disease. And it's particularly important vis-a-vis -vis things like MRIs and very expensive technologies. Let's, let's first, let's take it early. Let's take that 38-year-old, 42-year-old who's had some achiness. They're coming in, and obviously the first thing that any orthopedic surgeon or physician, for that matter, is going to do is hopefully a good history and physical examination. A lot of information, quite honestly, can be derived by simply talking to the patient, taking a quick look at how they walk, a five-minute examination of their knee and hip. And a lot of these problems, surgeons are, are pretty clear on what they think they're seeing before they ever even get to the x-ray. The x-ray, unfortunately, can be very, um, very unhelpful in early stage disease. Plenty of patients who were told, no, your hip or knee is fine because the x-ray was normal, actually have early degenerative arthritis. And a little bit more focus on that clinical exam would have made the diagnosis, or at least the suspicion. Uh, but the x-rays can be normal. And I think that's where an MRI can be very, very helpful, especially in the knee. It might uncover that meniscus injury, even though it's degenerative and wasn't related to an injury. It's torn, and that's part of their, their symptom complex, and it can recognize early arthritis at the same time. That can help um, either choose, uh, help guide the indication for surgery, either for or against. Um, and likewise in the hip, especially now as hip arthroscopy is coming onto the scene as a, as a very powerful tool, more and more hip uh, MRIs are, are guiding management in patients who otherwise would have been diagnosed. So the, the, the routine in your office and in most orthopedist office is first, as we were all taught as medical students, history is 85% yeah. of the uh, diagnosis and, and a good physical exam will help you. And then those x-rays to look for alignment, look for early mm -hmm. signs of arthritis are very useful. But as you say, sometimes they don't tell the whole story. Right. Do you typically do an MRI scan on everyone with knee yeah, pain? Yeah, that's a really important question. You know, as you and I have both talked before about how important uh, the Internet and information technologies are for patients as they are getting online and finding out good information. But they're also sometimes coming in with with um, wishes or desires or perceptions that they think should be done that actually aren't benefiting them. And an MRI too early in the sequence, quite honestly, is, is expensive, it's unnecessary, and unnecessary technologies can lead to unnecessary surgeries. Now, if that patient has truly had clinical management, conservative management, and it's failed, they truly are in a lot of pain. And by the time they're presenting to me, if we need to, they're real surgical candidates, that's a great time to get an MRI. But a lot of patients will actually pretty much expect to have that MRI as their first thing that I do. And I don't think that serves the patient because it might actually lead to a surgery they might not otherwise have had. Well, I think there's a lot of fear that the MRI scan is too good. It's yeah. showing abnormalities uh, that may not actually uh, have much relevance to right. what the patient is, is experiencing. Well, what I'm fond of saying to patients is that um, getting an MRI to look at an arthritic knee that's already arthritic on the x-ray is like using a magnifying glass to look at the wear and tear on your tire. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be very th frightening if you think about it, and it's just not an appropriate way to look at that level of degeneration in the case of the knee. So, yeah, it can definitely be an, ab an abused technology. When it's used correctly and aimed appropriately, then it's a very powerful tool and it should be used. Well, any other tests that you would use? I mean, are there any lab tests that you like to do? Are there any other tests like a bone scan mm -hmm. or anything like that, that that you feel like are necessary um, to try to make this diagnosis or, or is it pretty much the MRI scan? Well, clearly, you know, the orthopedic surgeon needs to be sensitive to the fact that, that 
so, some of these types of arthritis are so common, that, like the inflammatory arthropathies and the degenerative arthritis, that some patients will have both, mm -hmm. right? So uh, lab work that might be specifically directed at rheumatoid arthritis can really be an important tool for the orthopedic surgeon as well. Because as we pointed out, that, that would lead you down the road towards uh, uh, medical management instead of surgical. You know, um, other x-rays, I, I think that there is some real value, especially as we talk about malalignment arthritis, because I, I think that this technology that allows us to do long-axis weight-bearing films is a very powerful tool. Unfortunately, it's not, a, not that widespread and available to orthopedic surgeons, but as we look more and more down the alignment issues, uh, long-axis x-rays, bone scans, I think bone scans can be helpful when we're looking for that uh, multi-joint arthritis, when we're concerned that patients have um, gener you know, generalized symptoms. Uh, it can show you in one quick picture how many different joints are involved. And I think sometimes that can be, uh, have a bearing on treatment, but rarely for the orthopedic surgeon, mm -hmm. more for the rheumatologist. How about aspiration of the knee? I mean, some, some mm -hmm. folks come in with fluid on the knee. Mm -hmm. Do you routinely take a sample of that fluid and send it to lab, or do you do that just on a case-by-case -case basis? How do you deal with that? Definitely the surgeon needs to be prepared to do that. Mm. There's no question. Um, I think that for the majority of patients, by the time we're doing a good history and physical examination, if we're doing an aspiration, it's, it may be part to help with the diagnosis, but also part to help with treatment. An aspiration with an injection of steroid can be a very almost as effective as arthroscopy in the arthritic knee. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, I'm not really having to rely on that aspiration to make the diagnosis. Very helpful in the inflammatory arthri arthri arthritis, however. If I'm suspicious of gout, I can clinch the diagnosis. The only way I can clinch the diagnosis is with an aspiration and seeing those crystals under light microscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think every surgeon out there eventually learns to be very sensitive to the potential for an infectious um, cause of the arthritis, and the only way to really safely rule that out is with an aspiration. So it's an important tool for the rheumatologist and the orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Well, let's, let's move on a little bit to, to, to high-level concepts of treatment. Okay. And you mentioned sort of three stages of, mm -hmm. of wear and tear arthritis. You mentioned that, that early stage where the person's having right. some discomfort, may not be affecting their function, but they're just wondering what's going on. Then that middle phase where, yeah, it's beginning to sort of you know, I, I can no longer hike 12 miles. I right. can now hike six miles and my knee swells up and I don't want to do it anymore. And then you've got that late stage where it's really beginning to impact my ability to function, either at work, uh, in my sport, uh, or even in my life. Right. Let's go back and sort of define how you approach those three patients and start yeah. with that early person. What do you tell them? What do you do in terms of treatment? What are their treatment options at that point? Well, and now is when I, we're going to start talking a little bit more like doctors to doctors instead of just doctor to patient because it's a complex conversation and, and it spans a wide variety of patients. But uh, let's, let's, let's get past the medical management, the patient that's already had the anti-inflammatories and is coming to the orthopedic surgeon. I like to divide those into uh, early uh, operative management, midterm operative management, and then end stage operative management. And early, I would lump the aspiration injection, to mm -hmm. me, anything that involves something sharp that goes through your skin is surgical. So mm -hmm. I kind of consider a needle part of that early surgical management. Um, but for the most part, that first surgical management from the patient's point of view is going to be that arthroscopy mm -hmm. in the early arthritic knee. And, and the surgeon needs to be very judicious about helping, you know, making sure that he or she is deciding that this is truly early arthritis. Unfortunately, arthroscopy, or fortunately, arthroscopy is a loved, minimally invasive procedure that any reasonable patient would prefer to have over a more extensive surgery. But if we do it in, in arthritis that's more midterm or late, our success rates are going to be low. But in that early arthritic case, that if it is apparent on the x-ray, it's very mild. Now, the knee is pretty well aligned. Uh, the symptom complex fits more the isolated meniscus tear instead of generalized arthritis. Uh, those patients can enjoy an 85-90% success rate long term, two, three, four years out after an arthroscopy, focus more on the meniscectomy mm. than on the actual arthritis. So you're really looking in and trying to um, take care of anything that's torn, anything that's getting caught, anything that's getting in the way of the knee, and just pretty much cleaning the knee up a little bit, washing it out, and seeing what you get at that point. Okay, so well, actually, let's let's talk in more detail about what does arthroscopy for the arthritic knee really entail. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's quite a bit different than it is for arthroscopy for the simple meniscectomy. Uh, the typical arthritic knee will have the meniscus tear, it might even have two of them. And it will also have some wear and tear on the end of that, on the ends of the bone. If, if patients, people who are viewing this, just go to your website and look up knee arthritis, they'll see some nice schematics showing loss of that articular cartilage on the end of the bone. And so the arthroscopy is pretty limited in what it can do about that. You know, contrary to, our, to the media and our, our wishes, we don't really have a way of planting new cartilage back in there yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'd like to address it somewhat. So one of the things that surgeons will typically do is clean up the edges, the margins of that worn, up, worn out cartilage. If they're very small areas of wear and tear, there's been some promise with the microfracture techniques where we're trying to actually stimulate a little bit of repair mm -hmm. in those areas of wear and tear. And that's shown some promising results. There is a well-documented washout effect of arthroscopy in the arthritic knee. We, any surgeon who's stuck an arth arthroscope into an arthritic knee recognizes a reasonable amount of debris, just mm. cartilage that's worn off and is in the joint as well as considerable debris of inflammation. The joint looks uh, inflamed. There's a lot of uh, tissue that's uh, bloody and thick and looks angry. Mm -hmm. uh, so we believe that we know that washing some of that debris out has at least a short-term benefit for the patient. Uh, and then, um, you know, I think that realistically just the diagnosis helping to stage the joint, getting good photographs to show the patient what, their, what the real nature of their disease is helpful. Mm -hmm. So the patient should not expect this to cure the problem. Yeah. You're really buying time right. to, to try to treat this. And, and I think that's true for all arthritis that's surgery. Right. We're really, everything's temporary to some degree. Yeah. So what about that late stage? I mean, if you've done these, and we probably should talk about um, that person with the malalignment because yeah. that's a totally separate issue. Right. And when do you look at that patient and say, you know, I need to do something to this whole leg. Right. I need to re rejigger the leg, so to speak, yeah. to, to make the alignment more normal and try mm -hmm. to take the pressure off of those areas that are showing increased wear. Is that an early stage problem? No. I, you're right. That's a good, I'm glad you're making that difference because you said let's go to the late. And I'd right. say, well, no, the, that early arthritis is, is amenable to the arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. And I would consider end stage typically the total joint replacement. Right. And realistically, people between the ages of 45 and 65 very commonly are in that middle range mm -hmm. where they are appropriately seeking alternatives to joint replacement. They are, may not feel like they're quite at the end of their rope. And, and historically, orthopedics has had very little to offer those middle groups. They, they did well with their arthroscopies. The orthopedists historically have done well with their joint replacements. But there's been an increasing demand and need for interventions that meet that middle group. I would consider those uh, realignment surgeries, high tibial osteotomies, partial knee replacements would be another example of that. Uh, let's talk about the high tibial osteotomy first. This would be a uh, patient who's 36 years old, has always known that he was bow-legged, kind of joked about it, was no big deal. Now he's coming into my office and thinks he might have a little cartilage tear because they had an MRI and it showed a cartilage tear. But we look at the x-rays, particularly those long axis weight bearing films, and we see that that joint space has collapsed down bone to bone. Mm -hmm. And when I measure his axis, instead of being straight as an arrow like a plumb line, he's seven, eight, nine, ten 10 degrees off. Now this is a patient who, depending on when you catch them, whether their, their joint space loss is complete or partial, Realigning their leg can cure their arthritis. It's one that you said everything's temporary, and I had to kind of smile. Well, the one thing that's not temporary is if we catch early medial compartment disease in the bow leg and we correct that bow leggedness, we've cured their problem. Unfortunately, the majority of them, by the time they come to us, already have established arthritis, and we're, we're doing a high tibial osteotomy just to delay joint replacement mm -hmm. for 14 or 12 or 10 years. But, you know, I've had a few patients where we catch them in their early 20s, and Fortunately or unfortunately for them, they were painful before they got severely arthritic, and by correcting their bow leggedness, they're cured of their so, arthritis. So the cartilage degeneration stops at that point, or you can at least... Well, it, if you get it early, it can, number one, stop, and there are some studies that show that it has some potential to heal. Mm. It will actually reverse, uh, and those are a little bit more controversial, and, and now with new cartilage-enhancing technologies like cartilage transplants and oats uh, transplantations and such, some of that repair can be facilitated at the time of a high tibial osteotomy, surgically. Let's talk a little bit about what something you, you mentioned, and I think it's sometimes confusing. There is this procedure called OATS where we actually take the patient's cartilage, 
take a chunk of bone and cartilage and move it. Mm -hmm. And then there's the cartilage regeneration, where we actually take cartilage cells, send them to the lab somewhere, That's they right. grow for a while, we put them back in, and we're trying to grow them. Distinguish those two things, if you could. Yeah. And, and when... When is one appropriate and when is the other one appropriate? Okay, well, that's, some of that's going to be controversial and difficult mm -hmm. to answer, honestly. Uh, some cartilage-enhancing technologies, I think, are, are reasonably well accepted by the orthopedic community and are, you know, are, are done frequently. Certainly, an example of that would be the microfracture, where we're simply puncturing the bone to try to bring some of the marrow elements up to the articular surface and let it do its own natural healing power. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the OATS procedure. Uh, it, people can go online and read about this. They can see it uh, on a variety of websites. But the way I describe it to patients, if you've ever seen the way they, um, they move the cup on a golf green, okay, mm -hmm. basically they, they go and they dig a core. And, and in a way, the, a, a normal joint is like a pristine golf green. It's smooth and it's flat and there aren't any ridges or ripples. But the arthritic joint has ridges and ripples and defects. So if you, know, if you had a golf green that somebody took a divot out with their nine iron and you needed to repair it quick, you could go to another part of the green that you didn't think was so important, like the edge, take a core of dirt and the grass, place it in that more important part, pound it down and make it level, and it's essentially cured, mm -hmm. right? Because that grass on the top of that core is already supported by the soil underneath. And it's alive and it's continues it's to grow. It's alive and as it continues to grow, it'll actually merge with the surrounding grass and it'll be totally normal within days mm -hmm. for a grass. Uh, in the knee, we do a similar sort of thing where we go to a part of the knee joint that we don't consider to be as critical as the area of cartilage loss. And we virtually take a core of cartilage cap and underlying bone that's just ever so slightly larger than the defect. And, and then we go to the defect and take out just a core of bone and we make it flush and perfect, and the, in theory the cartilage underneath is already supported. Now, the key here is that the surrounding in the golf green, the rest of the golf green has to be healthy, right? So if I, if I take that core, it'll survive. Well, if the rest of the golf green isn't healthy and we just keep walking over the top of it, neither, neither the grass surrounding the core or the core will survive. And it, so what we have to be careful about with oats and why it has such a limited application is if the knee's badly aligned, and that's why they're getting their wear and tear disease, and I go take a core and put it there, then it's just going to die the same death. So whatever the, the, what we call the etiology, the cause of the problem, needs to be addressed just as aggressively as the little arthritic lesion. Mm -hmm. You mentioned another technology where we, um, we basically, we, where it's possible to take cartilage and culture it, to take cartilage cells, send it to a lab in Arlington, have it cultured and get it back in a vial, a little goo, and then go find that cartilage defect, take um, a, the lining around the bone called the periosteum and seal it over and then inject that, that goo into that joint or into that space and hope that that's going to also uh, enhance cartilage healing. That technology has been around now and in, in, in practice for 10, 12 years. The data on it is inconsistent, sometimes promising, not so other times not so promising. It's very expensive, and it involves two surgeries, one for the harvesting and one for the implantation. And uh, I, I think it, it's very promising from a, a future point of view because certainly on a lab level it's shown some promising results. Widespread application in patients is, is not here yet, mm -hmm. but it's yet another technology. Another one that you haven't mentioned are meniscal transplants, and I get patients commonly coming in and talking to me about that. Um, cartilage, meniscus cartilage that's actually kept in a donor refrigerator. Somebody, you know, uh, d dies and, and wills their body to medical science, and their meniscus is kept on freeze. And uh, it can be transplanted into a, a human knee. And, um, but the, the complication rate is very high, and it's another very expensive surgery and with very, very limited applications because it's, it's thought to be only uh, appropriate for patients whose symptoms of arthritis are, you know, the patient needs to hurt, but it can only be done in patients whose arthritis is very early. But if you remember earlier in our conversation, most of those patients who have early arthritis aren't that symptomatic. So mm -hmm. you're talking about a very large surgery in patients whose knees don't hurt that much. Um, so it's, again, another technology that has limited application. So it sounds like in that middle range, there's lots of choices, and usually the reason there's lots of choices is because nothing works 100% right. of the time. Exactly. Then we get to the end, the end stage person. 
typically the person that that you and I would probably recommend an artificial knee replacement mm -hmm. of some sort, either a partial art artificial knee or a full artificial knee. One question patients always ask, because I think we've trained them this way, and that is, uh, you know, 20 years ago, surgeons would say you can't have an artificial knee replacement until you're 65. Mm -hmm. That's not the same today, I I'm assuming. And tell me what your guidelines are. I guess in 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 an overall um, in the overall situation, how do you advise a patient when it's time to have an artificial knee joint, and when is it appropriate? Okay, well, that's, that's an, another important conversation because it's changed. You know, joint replacement knee and hip replacement really had its origins in the late 60s, early 70s, and weren't really being done on a large scale in the United States until the early 80s. When, and that wasn't that long ago. When you look at the evolution of surgery long term, 20 years is not very long. When joint replacement was first being done, it was a reasonably crude operation compared to what we're doing now. The instruments were not that good, the materials weren't that great, the wear properties weren't well understood, even the techniques were still under evolution. And it was characteristically described as uh, an operation that was reserved for the elderly, low demand patient whose arthritis was so severe that they were in such agony that they really couldn't stand to live that way. And, and that was appropriate for that technology. But <clears throat> things have changed. A lot of things have changed. The bearing surfaces have changed. The, the um, methodologies and the surgical techniques to put the joint replacements in, they are much lower profile. They don't consume as much bone. We're much better at put, putting them in very precisely. And, and we have seen systematically, decade by decade, these implants lasting longer and longer. Also, the other thing that has changed, quite honestly, is when you look at the average age of onset of arthritis being in the 50s and the fact that our baby boomer population is right there in the thick of joint replacement in the younger patient, mid-50s, mid-60s, you know, the idea that we would just take these, these old techniques and force them into young patients has really given way to a much higher level of, of surgical techniques and implants and, and such. So, now, in my practice, the average age of the patient getting a knee replacement or a hip replacement is 63. So when you figure a good number of them in their 70s, it means we're doing a reasonable number in their mid-50s. So that old rule of you can't have a knee replacement until you're 65 just doesn't hold water anymore. I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, there I is think no patients lower. will still hear that. I, right. I, I shouldn't say it doesn't hold water. I, I think that patients need to talk to their doctors and, and really get a good feeling for it because we certainly don't want to be doing them in younger patients unless it's truly necessary. Hmm. However, um, because of the circumstances that I've just mentioned and because of the technologies, an increasing number of patients are getting them done younger. Well, and I, th I think one of the things that uh, people were afraid of is that the younger you do the total knee, because mm -hmm. you, you, they only last for so long. Again, right. it goes back to this temporary notion. And in the old days, if you got 10, 10 years out of an artificial That's knee, right. you, you thought you were doing pretty good. That's right. Um, so you knew you were going to have to do that second one. Mm -hmm. And then that second one, always had a much lower success rate That's than right. that first one. So everybody wanted to get that patient to the age to where they could really count on that, that first knee replacement, that's right. hopefully to take them through their whole life. Right. I think that part of the things that's changed, not only is the knee replacement lasting longer, but those second ones are a lot better. Uh, we're, we're getting better results from the second that's or right. revision knee replacements, and so we're not so scared of doing that second one again. Well, and even our first ones that we're doing are much more bone preserving. Right. And there are more options instead of just doing full knee replacements in people. Some of their first ones are partial knee replacements that, that have been well documented now to, to help set up a situation where their second operation might be a primary total knee. Mm -hmm. And we're, yeah, we're, so we're, we're, we're doing well in terms of improving our long-term results on that first knee, putting that first knee off as long as possible, inserting some even less invasive and more bone preserving options in front of that total knee and once that total knee is done setting a stage for that first revision that for all intents and purposes is the primary total knee. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what I encourage patients to do is instead of looking at their age and saying how long is my knee going to last, looking at their situation and asking what's my plan. If I'm 78 and I'm getting my first total knee my plan can realistically be that that's going to be my only total knee. Unless something unusual happens, that's likely to be my only one. Total hip, total knee. If I'm 65, it's probably going to be my only one, but I need a plan in case I'm wrong. I need a backup that will be a good revision. If I'm 55, 
no matter how gifted the surgeon is, no matter how well you behave, no matter how good the implants are and how good our results tell us they're going to be, your plan should include a second operation in your lifetime. If you're lucky, you won't need it. But a, a person, particularly in their early 50s, needs to anticipate that that first joint replacement won't be their only one. Yeah, I agree. Um, let me summarize sort of, sort of where we've been with this whole discussion. And, and, and one is, is we began by discussing primarily degenerative arthritis or wear and tear arthritis or mm -hmm. osteoarthritis mm -hmm. of the knee. And for those folks who've had a significant injury, post-traumatic arthritis. Right. We, we've looked at, at early, mid, and late stage sort of options and how those, yeah. those patients differ and then how the treatment options differ. Right. Have we missed anything? I mean, if you, if you look back at all the things we've discussed for this, this whole continuum from the young patient with arthritis mm -hmm. all the way to the 78-year-old that you said who's getting that one total knee that's right. expected to last the rest of their mm -hmm. life, have we missed any options that patients should be aware of, something they should, should really ask their doctors about? Well, I, there, there's one that I get asked a lot and that, because we've really focused on traditional non-operative and operative management. We haven't really talked much about alternative uh, medicines, and certainly those are very common. Uh, they're common in the lay literature. They're common on the Internet. I get asked a lot about it. Some of them have been demonstrated to be very effective, and some of them not so effective. But, you know, interventions like glucosamine sulfate, uh, gin-soaked raisins, magnets, all kinds of things that patients hear about, which actually is one of my favorite topics to talk in public about. But uh, that's another real common one. And to the extent that it might be an environmental issue and, or uh, food allergy, I think some of those are, are very important. I don't think the orthopedic surgeon is the person to talk to about them, but it's, it does come up frequently in, in my practice. Well, let me put you on the spot about a couple of those. One uh -huh. is glucosamine. How do mm -hmm. you tell patients? Do you, yeah. do you recommend glucosamine sulfate? Do you feel like that the studies support its utilization? Yes, I do. I, you know, I, and I've constantly reevaluated re that and looked at the numbers and looked at the statistics, and I would say that Glucosamine sulfate and its combination with chondroitin sulfate and manganese and some of the other um, common mixtures is probably the only um, alternative um, non-pharmaceutical intervention that I would say has actually earned a place in terms of double-blinded trials, clinical trials. And it, and it, it has some advantages and disadvantages. It has one distinct advantage that it doesn't cause any real side effects of, of, of real significance. Uh, it takes a long time for it to have its effect, and patients tend to need to be on it for a long time. But uh, certainly I counsel patients to try it, especially in those early cases. It won't have much impact later, but uh, it can be equivalent to some of the more common anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. For symptom control. Right. Do you feel like there's any basis to tell patients that it actually either slows down the arthritis or it know. actually regenerates cartilage? You know, I think what happens is when they read the lay literature, they get this impression that it actually grows cartilage. Right. And I, there's no data to support that. And I don't think that's reasonable to expect that. We all know that short of that malalignment disease that gets corrected or the post-traumatic arthritis that gets fixed, there is no cure for arthritis. And it relentlessly progresses, particularly wear and tear arthritis. Uh, so expecting glucosamine sulfate or any of these medicines to actually reverse or halt arthritic change wouldn't be rational. Well, there is one other thing that we haven't discussed, and we probably should in the face of discussing glucosamine, and that is the injectable hyalgin, uh -huh. the, the injectable stuff, right. not cortisone. I mean, a lot of people right. confuse it with cortisone. Cortisone just calms down inflammation, but hyalgin or Synvisc uh, are a couple of the brand names, but basically what we yeah. refer to these is, is visco supplementation. Right. What's your position on them? It's evolving. Another one that, that seems to, it's a recent player when you look at the last 20 years. Basically, as you know, normal joint fluid has this, as you've mentioned, viscoelasticity. It, it's a fluid that, that compresses well, that provides a nice lubrication layer. And the reason it does that is because normal joint fluid is this very long chain polymer called hyaluronic acid. And it's that long chain nature that gives it its viscoelastic quality. In the arthritic knee, particularly inflammatory arthritis and wear and tear arthritis, the long chain gets cut up into smaller chains and it starts to lose that viscoelastic quality. That's why some patients will talk about this like an oil change. Mm -hmm. Basically, 
the insight was, well, maybe if we can supplement that, we can help to relieve those symptoms. And hyaluronic acid turns out to be available in other sources, chickens, coxcombs, horses' hooves, and, and that can be, quote unquote, purified, not synthesized, it's purified, and then injected into the human joint. Uh, the original players requir required five injections. Um, they weren't uh, necessarily purified all that well, so a second series sometimes caused reactions because it is an, an it is an animal glycoprotein, so it can patients can get sensitized to it. Um, more recent formulations are more highly purified, maybe a little bit safer. When you look at trials that have been really uh, focused at trying to evaluate the results. Unfortunately, some of those trials have been conducted by the companies that are, are producing it, so we always feel like those need to be corroborated elsewhere, and they're not, they haven't always been corroborated well in other studies. But the general consensus out there that I have experienced and that I hear other surgeons uh, expressing is that a reasonable number of their patients with early to mild arthritis who have failed medicines and failed steroid injections will respond for 8 to 12 months to these injection series. I think it's a, a very reasonable uh, entry in our armamentarium, particularly for temporary solutions. So you think it's worth trying and it's relatively safe. Mm -hmm. There's always a risk of infection and the allergic reaction you're talking about, but mm -hmm. relatively safe for the most part. Yeah. If I, I think there's some, you know, there's a technique to it and it can be done wrong. And mm -hmm. if it's done wrong, that can cause some pain for the patient. Uh, but as long as it's done well, and uh, surgeons and, and physicians are, are judicious about the, the repeated sequences, then they'll be fine. Okay. Well, this has been a great discussion about primarily degenerative arthritis of the knee. Anything that we haven't covered that you feel like patients should know who are faced with, with making decisions about their mm -hmm. own health care, if they've got that first uh, episode of knee pain or they're, maybe they've had knee pain for a year and they've been putting it off and they they just have finally uh, made the decision that it's time to think about it. Uh -huh. any, any parting remarks or any advice you would give that patient? Well, I, I, you and I have chatted about this before. The, the opportunities for patients to do their discovery on the Internet or with their, their sources of information within their family and friends is, is increasing all the time. In the end, it, it's way too complex a topic to try to satisfy in a 20 to 30 minute interview, and every patient is different. And what I, what I counsel my patients to do is, is formulate your questions, really probe. And if you don't feel like you're getting good answers, be willing to go on to the next position, whatever it takes. But in the end, um, you, need a, you need a good counselor who will guide you through all these issues because they are complex and they're unique to every patient. Well, thank you. Excellent information. And I think this will help patients uh, uh, choose the right path for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.